A lot of us have been there. The plane is taxing toward takeoff. The flight attendants give the safety lecture. They tell you to read the safety card in the seat pocket in front of you, which most of us only pretend to do, right? Because we already know the drill. Fasten your seatbelt, locate the nearest exit, and if the oxygen mask deploys, you put it on. But there's one piece of advice that isn't aimed at everyone on the plane. It's only for a specific group of people. Caregivers, put on your own mask first. And what an interesting instruction that is. It's clearly directed at those who are looking after someone, a child, a frail parent, or a person with a disability in the next seat. Someone who apparently would instinctively look after someone else before themselves. But in an emergency, on an airplane, that could be dangerous. Caregivers need to be able to provide care. And to do so, they need to put on their own mask first. And today, we all find ourselves in an emergency, and our caregivers, many of whom are in the audience today, are stepping up in incredible ways but they really do need to read the safety card. And those who love them need to remind them, put on your own mask first. We know those caregivers are overwhelmingly women. In Canada, 80% of healthcare providers are women, 40% of our doctors, 90% of our personal support workers, and 90% of our nurses. And outside of healthcare, in homes and families and communities, it's just as pronounced. Women are far more likely to have the role of caregiver. And they're good at it. And the emergency that all these caregivers have now found themselves in is, of course, a pandemic. The first major pandemic in over 100 years lasting much longer than any of us could have imagined. More of a marathon than a sprint. And a pandemic presents many issues. It puts care, especially health care, in high demand. And it has a way of exposing things, like the cracks in the system, like the unequal way that low-income and racialized neighborhoods are affected. But also, the tendency for all those caregivers in all those neighborhoods, and everywhere else for that matter, to devote less attention to self-care, to not put on their own mask first. At the onset of the pandemic, you'd often hear in the media it's an equal opportunity virus, but as it spread, it became abundantly clear that it wasn't. Pandemics affect different groups in very different ways, and they affect women differently than men. Some ways are medical. Women are more likely to get COVID, but less likely to die from it. And women, as healthcare workers, are disproportionately contributing to the work of caring for those suffering from the virus. And this isn't new. Women have played important roles in pandemics before. During the plagues of 17th century London, the care of the sick and dying invariably fell to women. They were called plague nurses. And you can see one at work here in this remarkable eyewitness painting of the plague of 1720 in Marseille. An 18th century caregiver, equivalent to today's nurse or PSW, attending to the sick and dying. I personally see the impact in primary care and cancer care. In April 2020, as the cases climbed, at that time, you might recall, was mostly women in healthcare, we launched a COVID care at home program to virtually monitor and support those with mild to moderate COVID in their homes. What we did was we modified and updated a published clinical pathway. We couriered oxygen saturation monitors and thermometers to homes as needed 
so we could get objective measures of disease. And then we monitored with up to twice daily video visits to care for these often quite complex patients, sick with an as yet unknown illness. And we learned that patients with mild to moderate COVID can be managed safely and effectively in a family medicine led virtual program. And we published, in fact, we published the first case series in this area, which actually showed differences in the way men and women present. Women are more likely to have a loss of smell or headache as a presenting symptom, as opposed to men who are more likely to have a cough or shortness of breath. But some of the best care we delivered was in fact addressing the social determinants of health and reinforcing the need for women to self-care, to isolate in their own room and bathroom whenever possible, to perform regular checks with the pulse oximeter that we sent to the home, and reminding them not to inadvertently put others at risk by going back to work too soon or going grocery shopping for the family while still infected. Our social workers connected people with community resources like Red Cross for food delivery and helped many with, for, apply for financial support so they could better focus on their own self-care. Now, as a hospital without beds, we were proud that we had identified a program with constructive, actionable ways to keep many people with COVID out of hospital. But of course, in a pandemic, it's not just the effect of the disease, it's the effect of the effect. The impact of the pandemic on so many other conditions. We saw more women long overdue for cancer screening and women with symptoms suggestive of cancer presenting after having experienced these symptoms for many months. Why? Well, partially because nobody wanted to come into the hospital or healthcare setting and risk getting COVID. But also we kept hearing the same story of women caring for others instead of themselves. Many were continuing to work full time virtually from home whilst homeschooling their children and in many cases caring for a sick or elderly relative. So when case counts were lower between wave one and two, we called in our patients for catch up cancer screening and we communicated via a social media campaign, a list of possible cancer symptoms that should not be ignored. And we all began to truly appreciate the invaluable contributions of our own skilled frontline secretaries and nurses, our superheroes. They helped us triage the calls, the photos, the emails that came from our patients to ensure that we could see those that needed to be seen. And our dedicated family doctors, nurse practitioners and interprofessionals did not stop working. In fact, we had 20% more visits at our peak, mostly virtual, but it wasn't enough. In our sexual assault and domestic violence center, we saw a disturbing twofold increase in domestic violence cases. And with a team of RNs available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no appointment necessary, we were reassured that some women were asking for help. But we wondered how many more were out there that hadn't. We also saw a marked increase in women dealing with mental health issues, anxiety, depression, and loneliness, as well as an increase in alcohol use and that famous COVID 10, 15, 20, I don't know, pound weight gain. I've lost track. And then in December, when it was cold and we could no longer do those wonderful outside family dinners that we so enjoyed, we finally had the news of the approval of two new COVID vaccines. And we could kind of see that there was a bit of light at the end of the long, dark tunnel. Knowing that many trust their healthcare providers when it comes to advice around vaccine, we joined a national consortium called 19 to Zero, a large group with the sole intent of ensuring clear positive messaging around COVID vaccines in hopes of encouraging enough people to take the vaccine so herd immunity could be reached and we could all hug our loved ones again. 
workforce. This was no small challenge. There's a lot of misinformation out there. But we started with some simple, clear messages. And that is that COVID vaccines are free, they are safe, and they are effective after the second dose. They do not cause COVID, and on balance, it's probably fine to give them to breastfeeding and pregnant women. And of course, the most important message is that vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. We do have to get them in arms. Yet, we still found many women healthcare workers, my colleagues included, hesitant to take the vaccine, suggesting others be considered first. Despite knowing, if not protected, they could actually harm not only themselves, but their patients and their families. So you can see that the cost of not putting on your own mask first, not caring for yourself before others, can be high. And we must not lose sight of the fact that these issues were exacerbated by the pandemic, not caused by it. They were always there. So how exactly do we put on our own mask first? What steps can we take to better self-care for ourselves? First off, ask for help and be specific. I need you to call my mother-in-law. I need you to arrange for, for meals three days this week. Be active. This is your single best tool in the toolkit, the best thing you can do for your health. Ideally, 30 minutes a day, most days, but start low, go slow, and reward yourself for success. Do not beat yourself up for missing a day. Meditate. Find a way to slow down your thoughts and your thinking, whether it be yoga, deep breathing, listening to music, or nature sounds. Find something that calms you. Limit your alcohol, smoking and sweets. There is a relationship between alcohol and cancer, particularly breast cancer. So the current recommendation for women is less than one drink per day on average. Do your cancer screening, and if you have symptoms, seek help. Connect with your family physician, and if you don't have one, get one. It is safe to come visit us. And if you are threatened, create a safety plan. Know your exit strategy. And when it is your turn, get vaccinated and encourage others to do the same. If we put these all together, we can actually create our own pandemic safety card. It might look something like this. This need for women to care for themselves before others, highlighted by the pandemic, should be a guiding principle for each and every one of us every day. And in much the same way that we often only pretend to read that airplane safety card as we taxi down the runway on, on our exciting adventure, we often tune out the signs and signals our mind and body are sending us about our own health and well being. So, why not use the pandemic as a reminder to care? for ourselves too, and put on our own mask first.